Hello everyone. Um, really great to see lots of you joining us today for the biology session. Sorry that we're a few minutes late, um, but so good to see lots of you still with us. Um, and I hope you've all enjoyed the sessions that we've had um, earlier today. Um, just to say before we get started, as always, um, all of these sessions are recorded and if you have joined um, or signed up to the My Tutor Online School, then you'll be able to get emails with links to all of these recordings so you can watch everything back um, as and when you want to, which is great. Um, and the session for biology today will be an hour long um, and how we run it is 45 minutes for the tutor to teach the content and then 15 minutes um, at the end for questions um, but you can always send your questions through before the end um, using the chat function or the Q&A function um, and um, one of us will be sure to pick up the questions for you. Um, so as you can see today's session is um, on non-communicable diseases um, and it will be led by um, our biology tutor Charlotte um, who has been leading all of the biology sessions um, during the My Tutor online school. So lots of you should know Charlotte by now. Um, but if this is your first time um, kind of joining one of these sessions, um, then I'm sure you'll get to know lots more about Charlotte. She has um, studied conservation and biodiversity at Exeter University. Um, and she's done over 150 lessons with my tutor. So I'm gonna let Charlotte take over the lesson now um, and I'll be taking questions um, at the end. Perfect. Thanks very much. Um, just going to load up slides for this lesson. Um, as said, today is about non-communicable diseases. Um, so it kind of follows on from what we did last time a little bit um, in that uh, we were talking about the heart last time. Um, before we talked about plant organisation. So it follows on a little bit from our human biology studies. Hopefully, we can get these slides loaded up. So this topic leads in nicely to the rest of health and disease. Here we are. Okay. So over the next few sessions, we're going to learn all about um, non-communicable and communicable diseases. And we're also going to start looking at immunity as well. So this is all human biology, um, all about all of the things that can go wrong with us and how we can stop that. So I thought we'd start by having a think about what health means. Um, and the difference between communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases. So our health is how we describe our physical and mental well-being and we say that we're in good health when we have good physical and mental health. Um, but diseases can cause problems with our health, so with our physical and mental well-being. And communicable diseases are diseases that can be transferred from one person or organism to another. Whereas non-communicable diseases are not transferred between people and or organisms. So, for example, an example of a communicable disease would be chickenpox, which a lot of us had when we were small, that went through our classrooms like wildfire, as far as I remember. Um, whereas non-communicable diseases such as cancer or heart disease develop within the body and aren't transferred between people. Can different types of disease interact? Yes, they can. So um, we're going to talk a little bit later on about what kind of risk factors are and how they contribute to um, us being more susceptible to some diseases than others. But different types of diseases can um, affect each other as well. So, um, for example, our immune systems and infectious diseases. So some infectious diseases directly affect our immune systems, and that means that we're more likely to get other diseases. Equally, there are some viruses that make us more susceptible to cancer and also immune reactions and allergies. So 
for example, um, allergies such as hay fever and some allergies can affect our immune systems, make us a bit more um, susceptible to disease. And physical health and mental health. If you're not in good physical health, it can often affect our mental health as well. So those two are very intricately connected. Okay, so we're going to look at two examples of non-communicable diseases in detail. We're going to look at heart disease and at cancer. And then we're going to have a look at what contributes to each of those um, diseases, so the risk factors that we can have that help make us more susceptible. So coronary heart disease. Coronary heart disease is when um, fatty material builds up in our arteries. We talked about the arteries that leave the heart when we looked at um, transport systems in humans. Um, and the coronary arteries around the heart can be blocked by certain kinds of cholesterol, which is a type of fatty substance that we get from what we eat. That this restricts blood and oxygen getting to the heart and can therefore cause a heart attack where our heart stops beating for a while. Symptoms, shortness of breath, dizziness and chest pain. And you can see in our diagram here, here's the heart showing a normal artery, there's a cross section there. And then you can see these fatty deposits building up and narrowing that artery. So it's more difficult for the blood to get through and supply the heart properly. Another part of heart disease can be due to faulty heart valves, either not opening properly or not closing properly. So if heart valves don't open properly, then the blood can be restricted when it's moving from the top of the heart, the atria, to the ventricles at the bottom of the heart. So therefore there's not as much being pumped from the ventricles out to the body. Or if, um, heart valves aren't closing properly then it can mean that when those ventricles pump at the bottom of the heart to try and send the blood out through those arteries that some of the blood ends up going back into the atrium and again this can lead to heart failure so what do we do about it well there are four options for treating heart disease or faulty valves in a heart the first is stents. These are funny little sort of balloons, I suppose, but they're like balloons of mesh that are, they're inserted into the arteries and they're blown up and therefore they keep that artery open. So you can see in the diagram here, um, you insert what's called a catheter that goes all the way through to that artery, you then inflate the balloon part of the stent and then remove that central catheter so you're removing the, the pipe as such that took it down there and you leave that um, stent bolstering the walls of the artery keeping it open. You can also use statins which are drugs that reduce cholesterol production in the liver so they help to um, stop as much cholesterol being produced and building up in those arteries. These are taken for life um, and they're not suitable for certain people. So for example, those with liver disease or pregnant women, they're not suitable for, so they can't be for everyone. Then we also have artificial valves. That's how we would treat those um, faulty valves that we were talking about within the heart. Um, they can be made from human or animal tissues, or they can be um, a mechanical valve, so like a very um, hard wearing material. Nose can be put straight into the heart um, and they work just as a valve would. So the valves are those flaps that stop the blood going the wrong way um, and those um, can be manufactured from human or animal tissues or um, a synthetic material as well, man-made material. And, and finally, as a last resort, we have heart transplants. These are very rare, they're definitely a last option. So usually for a heart transplant, it's got very, very bad and the heart is very badly corroded and really isn't working at all. And quite often they'll pop in an artificial heart first, which is what you can see here, these artificial pumps here. 
um, which acts in the same way and that until they can replace the heart with either another human heart or pig hearts have been used in the past as well. But they are, as I say, a final option. They are not always successful. So they're very much a last resort. Okay, so that's a bit of a summary of coronary heart disease. Let's have a look at cancer. Um, so cancer is a disease that exists in our cells. Um, cancerous cells uh, have been mutated and they grow and they divide uncontrollably, eventually forming a growth called a tumour. Tumours can be either benign or malignant. Benign tumours are slow growing. They usually grow within one membrane, so they just stretch the membrane of a single cell. So they can be fairly easily removed and they don't invite, invade other parts of the body. So you can have a tumour in a part of your body that's benign, it's there, it's growing, it's not spreading. When it gets too big, it may well need removing. But there's not as much rush as when you have a malignant tumour, which grows very quickly, it invades its neighbouring cells and can spread in the bloodstream as well, so infect another part of the body that's completely separate. Um, and as the tumour grows, cells can detach, um, spread through that bloodstream and form secondary tumours in other parts of the body. That is known as metastasis. Can't quite see that word there because it's just been moved. Type it in. Metastasis, that word is. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So secondary tumour development. Um, we can see in our diagram here, um, the malignant cell in green, and the normal cells all around. So you can see it there beginning to grow, become a tumour. So the first tumour secretes chemicals and those chemicals cause blood vessels to grow around that first tumour. So they kind of attract those blood vessels in. Then once the blood vessels have surrounded that tumour, um, some of the cells from the first tumour detach, move into the blood, and then uh, travel around the body. Then when it reaches a different part of the body in a capillary, it will squeeze, a, one of those cells will squeeze through the capillary wall, invade another of the body's healthy body cells, start to divide and form that secondary tumour. So it can be in a completely different part of the body. So that's how cancer spreads. Cancer is caused by mutations. Normally those mutations, um, there needs to be many of them. So that's why we tend to see cancer in older people, because there's been more time for there to be more mutations in DNA that cause those uncontrollably dividing cells to form tumours. OK, so that's two examples of non-communicable diseases that you can talk about in your exam. Um, what makes us more susceptible to those diseases? What means that we are more likely to catch them? Well, for that, we talk about risk factors. So risk factors are things that are linked to an increased rate of disease. They can be lifestyle aspects or substances in the person's body or environment, generally. How do we determine risk factors? So if we look at this graph here, we can see that number of cigarettes smoked per person is on the left axis and on the right, lung cancer deaths per 100,000 persons. The blue line, number of cigarettes smoked per person, increases roughly from 1900 until there's about a peak at 1965. And the male lung cancer death rate doesn't begin until 1930, but then increases as well, up to a peak about 30 years after the initial stop, 1995-ish. Equally, the female lung cancer death rate plateaus for a while and then that increases. So we can see from this graph that there is a bit of a correlation 
between number of cigarettes smoked per person and lung cancer deaths. Both of those lines are going up. And we can see, we know that cancer takes a while to develop. So this delay here between number of cigarettes smoked uh, increasing and then um, number of cancer incidences increasing is explained by the time it takes for that disease to form in the body. So we know that there is, um, that both number of cigarettes smoked per person and lung cancer deaths are increasing. We know that this is a correlation. However, correlation does not equal causation. There's nothing from this graph that proves that the number of cigarettes smoked per person has actually caused those, that increase in lung cancer deaths. So then we need to look for a mechanism of causation. And only when we have that mechanism of causation, that way that we know that um, smoking cigarettes may be causing that lung cancer, then we can call smoking cigarettes a risk factor for developing lung cancer. So in order to call something a risk factor, there needs to be a correlation and a causation, a mechanism behind it. So now we're going to have a look at how some of risk factors affect some diseases. So this is quite a crowded slide here, but we'll do half of it at a time. So this is looking at the effect of diet, smoking and exercise on cardiovascular disease. We just learned about cardiovascular disease. That was about um, the arteries um, having a fatty substance build up in them. So how does smoking affect this? So smoking is the ingestion of smoke. That um, the, the smoke itself and the chemicals in it can damage the lining of the arteries. And that damage in the lining of an artery then gives a bit more of a hold for the cholesterol to hang on to and build up within that artery. So the damage from the smoke can increase the cholesterol buildup. Cigarettes contain carbon monoxide, which is a poisonous gas. The carbon monoxide that we then take in when we smoke reduces the amount of oxygen carried in our blood. Because we're more likely to get breathless, less likely to be able to get enough oxygen to our cells for enough respiration to take place. And finally, nicotine, which is the active drug in cigarette smoke, increases heart rate. It's a stimulant. And that um, Obviously, if you've got any um, blockages in your arteries, an increase in heart rate means that, means that it's even more difficult for the heart to cope with how little blood is getting to it. And finally, other chemicals increase blood clotting. So where um, cholesterol is building up in the arteries, there's less and less room for the blood to get through, and it's more and more likely to clot and form almost a barrier to itself. And the chemicals in smoking help with that as well. So there's lots and lots of ways that smoking can encourage cardiovascular disease. And so it's definitely a risk factor. OK. How does diet and exercise help with? Um, how can diet and exercise be a risk factor for cardiovascular disease? So obesity. Um, so being extremely overweight due to, say, a bad diet and very little exercise can lead to high blood pressure and a buildup of cholesterol. So that only exacerbates the buildup of cholesterol in arteries and then cardiovascular disease. Obesity also increases the likelihood of diabetes. So diabetes is um, where the body can't use insulin to regulate its blood sugar levels. And the more body fat that you have, the more difficult it is for the body to do that, to use insulin to regulate its blood sugar levels. Higher blood sugar, in turn, increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, more cholesterol buildup, eventually leading to cardiovascular disease. Increased exercise and eating a balanced diet lowers the risk of both diabetes and cardiovascular disease in later life. 
we've got some graphs here to practice our graph um, our graph skills. Okay, so um, we've got a graph each here for men and women, men at the top, women at the bottom. Increased risk of type 2 diabetes in percentages. And then on the bottom, we've got our body mass index, our BMI. Um, the bars here are divided into three colours, healthy weight, overweight and obese. And we can see that obese, obesity, particularly in women, causes a much higher percentage risk of type 2 diabetes. That's how we would interpret those graphs. Okay. Next, we're going to look at how alcohol um, affects the liver and brain function. So we haven't really talked about the liver or the brain yet, um, but you need to know that alcohol is a risk factor for um, some liver diseases and also um, some breakdown of functions in the brain. Um, so alcohol is another risk factor. So in the liver, the role of the liver is to process and break down alcohol. It's our own mechanism for dealing with alcohol um, and also lots of other substances in our bodies. And it's also responsible um, for other processes as well. However, alcohol has a particular effect on it. If um, we drink lots of alcohol over a long term, um, the alcohol causes a reaction where lipids, so we talked about lipids, they're the fatty um, substances that we eat, um, they build up in the liver and they cause something called fatty liver disease. And you can see on the diagram on the bottom here, our fatty liver in the middle there, there's the healthy liver, nice glow on there. And then a fatty liver, which gets these kind of hard bits where there's fat build up. Alcohol damage to liver can lead to swelling of the liver, which is called hepatitis, that's something different. That can be fatal, swelling of the liver means that it can't perform its functions properly. After lots of buildup of fatty lipids, the liver can become scarred, that's called sarcosis, and you can see a sarcotic liver there at the bottom. So sarcosis is when the liver becomes really scarred and really hard, develops lots and lots of scar tissue, which means that um, things can't move through it as easily as they did before. Um, and it becomes this kind of hard mass that doesn't really function as a liver at all. Um, so usually the liver can regenerate its own cells, but alcohol does prevent it from doing that. So it can't even heal itself. So alcohol is very bad for our livers when drunk in, uh, in large quantities over a long time. So small quantities, um, not too regularly are fine because the regeneration of the liver can keep up with it. But over a long term, it does start to do damage that the liver can't keep up with. Okay, so how does alcohol affect brains? Um, if you've ever seen someone that's drunk, um, drunk people have slow reaction times. They often can't walk properly. Sometimes they don't remember whole parts of their evening. Their speech may be slurred. Um, quite often they can't sleep. And quite often they're very sad. And all of this is a, an effect of alcohol on the brain. So it slows um, our nerves and our brain, slows our reaction time um, and affects lots of our motor functions as well so our movement is also a depressant so it increases anxiety and depression alcohol when when drunk regularly and in the long term drinking excessive alcohol causes brain shrinkage memory problems and psychiatric problems so it can directly affect the brain in an irreversible way um, in the long term when drunk excessively okay let's move on to how is smoking a risk factor for lung disease and lung cancer? So we talked about smoking um, on our heart. Now let's talk about how smoking affects lungs. So there's two ways. 
So lung disease and lung cancer. So we're looking at this particular disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD in the lungs. Includes chronic bronchitis and emphysema. This is a lot of words. <laughs> um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a disease of the lungs where your alveoli are blocked. So they can't uh, exchange gases like they normally would with the blood. So COPD means that oxygen can't get to the blood. The way that smoking causes this is that it damages the bronchioles and the alveoli directly. So the chemicals and the substances that are contained in cigarette smoke go straight into the lungs when we breathe them in, and they're directly abrasive to the alveoli. They, they physically scrape away some of it. Um, alveoli become inflamed, and when they become inflamed, the body's immune response is like, hey, let's put some healing stuff on here, and it sends it in the mucus. Mucus is designed to get rid of bad things and also provide um, a kind of healthy substance and underneath which the body can heal. But lots of mucus in the lungs means that, again, the gases that we're breathing in can't get to our alveoli and can't get into our blood. Patient becomes breathless and finds it difficult to get enough oxygen for respiration. And the damage is permanent. I've included um, a picture here of this is a healthy lung on the left and then um, the lung of someone that's been smoking for a long time on the right. Your lung doesn't look like this after you've smoked one cigarette. It takes a lot of cigarettes over time. But the black stuff that you can see there is tar that's building up in the lungs. Um, tar is in cigarette smoke. Um, it's one of the substances that helps um, break down the alveoli and you can see it's build up there. That, that lung is very, very black, and very damaged. So lung cancer. Lung cancer is um, uncontrollable dividing cells within the lung, so forming tumours within the lung. So there are some chemicals in cigarette smoke that act as carcinogens. Carcinogens is the word that we use to describe things that increase the chance of cancer, things that cause cancer. So some of the chemicals in cigarette smoke cause cancer. And the vast majority of cases of lung cancer are caused by smoking. Got another great graph to interpret here from Cancer Research UK. Um, so we've got the number, a percentage of adults who smoke on the y-axis here, and then lung cancer rates on the y-axis on the right-hand side. We've got year along the bottom. So adult cigarette smokers who are male and adult cigarette smokers who are female are the purple and green lines. We look at them there, purple and green, we have a lower percentage of females who smoke as adults um, to start with in 1950, and they've pretty much converged in 2010. Male rate of lung cancer starts a bit after we started smoking, because it takes a while for that cancer to develop in the body. The same for females. And the male rate does go down as the number of smokers goes down. For females, Females um, tended to carry on smoking longer than males, so smoking was still very fashionable for women in the 1960s and 70s. So you can see that um, cancer there was sort of increasing after there started to be a decrease in smoke. But you can see at the end here, there's just started to be a dip, so it's just caught up with where um, rates of male lung cancer are. Okay. Effects of smoking and alcohol on unborn babies. So I feel like we're, we're focusing an awful lot on smoking and alcohol here, and it's because they're two of the most common substances that are put into bodies, and therefore it's, they um, have been readily identified as risk factors for a lot of these diseases. So smoking for unborn babies increases the risk of miscarriage, so of terminating the pregnancy before the child's ready 
um, to be born. Babies are more likely to have respiratory infections leading to asthma, so as well as affecting um, the parents' lungs, smoking is also likely to affect the respiratory organs of babies as well, including the lungs. Um, smoking increases the likelihood of long-term growth and intellectual development in children, so it might mean that um, babies are smaller, don't develop as well. Increases the risk of birth defects and reduces the birth weight of babies. Alcohol um, ingested during pregnancy um, can lead to a whole variety of behavioural, physical and developmental effects in babies. Um, in particular, it can lead to fetal alcohol syndrome. Fetal alcohol syndrome is, um, well, it causes in the, in the fetus a smaller brain with fewer neurons, so fewer functions, um, that will have long-term behavioural and learning difficulties and has distinct facial features. So alco um, alcohol can lead to fetal alcohol syndrome in babies that will therefore have a long-term behavioural and learning difficulty. You can see the difference in brain size there. So a normal brain is on left here, and then a smaller brain of um, a baby with fetal alcohol syndrome on the right. And you can also see a graph here showing a direct effect of smoking quantity of cigarettes on baby birth weight. So more cigarettes means a um, much smaller baby at birth. Okay, and finally, this is our final slide, yes, final content slide. Um, carcinogens as risk factors for cancer. So we talked briefly about what a carcinogen is. Um, it's a chemical and other agent that cause cancer by causing mutations in DNA. Uh, usually several mutations are needed, so we're more likely to develop cancer as we get older. We mentioned that earlier when we were talking about cancer as a non-communicable disease. Carcinogens are the things that cause cancer, so cause those mutations. Lifestyle risk factors for cancer. So there are some viruses that can act as carcinogens, so e.g. HPV, which is the human papilloma virus, that um, leads to much um, greater risk of ovarian cancer in women. Chemical carcinogens in cigarette smoke, they are, as we've just talked about, a major cause of lung cancer. Alcohol intake in excess, again, is associated with certain cancers as well. And diet, we talked about the effect of diet on di um, diabetes and cardiovascular disease but it can also increase the risk of cancer if it's a particularly fatty or salty diet over a long period of time. So as well as making us gain weight, be more susceptible to diabetes and um, cardiovascular disease, a bad diet can also increase the risk of cancer. Uh, and there's other industrial and environmental risk factors for cancer. So we're all told to put on sun cream in the summer when the weather's been nice like it has the last few days. Um, so I don't know about you guys, but I've been out for my daily walk and I did find that my face is getting a little bit sunburnt on one day. Um, so exposure to um, ultraviolet radiation when sunbathing in particular does increase our risk of skin cancer. So that's why sun cream is so important. Um, you can also be exposed to ionising radiation at work, depending on your job. There are some jobs where you are exposed as a matter of course, particularly, um, so for example, x-rays use ionising radiation. So anyone who's taking your x-ray in hospital will wear protective clothing. You can also be exposed to chemical carcinogens out and about. Um, again, these have to, you have to be exposed to them in large quantities for there to be a big risk of cancer. So it's not like every time we walk outside, we directly expose ourselves to a risk for cancer. And um, you'd have to do it over a long time. There's also some genetic factors that increase the risk of cancer. So it can be in our DNA 
um, as well that we may be more at risk. It doesn't mean that we'll necessarily get cancer, it means that we may be more likely if we're exposed to the right conditions. Okay, so I think that was a, quite a sort of whistle-stop tour of non-communicable disease and some of the risk factors behind them. And I also feel like I've talked a lot about how we shouldn't drink and we shouldn't smoke and we shouldn't eat badly. And we shouldn't do any of those things in excess. And that's the thing. Um, it's okay to have a drink occasionally, but maybe not lots and lots regularly. Um, and smoking one cigarette isn't going to make sure that you have lung cancer. It does mean that you're at risk, but it doesn't mean that you'll get it. And eating well and exercising regularly um, is something that improves every part of our well-being. From di less risk of diabetes, less risk of cardiovascular disease. We tend to feel better. It's better for our mental health if we exercise regularly and we eat well. But it's okay to eat lots of chocolate over Easter, <laughs> not to too much excess. Okay, um, let's answer some of your questions and then let's do a practice question. So, um, have we got some questions? I think we do. Um, hi, Charlotte. We do have quite a few. Um, yeah. We have one asking, um, what does the carbon, mon carbon monoxide do to the haemoglobin? So, carbon dioxide affects haemoglobin by... So, basically, haemoglobin... This might be kind of going into A-level content here, but some of you might be thinking of going on to A-level biology, so I'll explain it quickly. Hemoglobin has four kind of docking stations for oxygen. Carbon monoxide takes up at least one of those. So it means that the hemoglobin just has less space to take on oxygen particles. Okay, great. Um, and then would, would the liver not be affected if we take small portions of alcohol? Uh, so alcohol generally does cause a little bit of damage to the liver, but because the liver can regenerate its own cells and it's used to breaking down particles, that's what the liver does. So a little bit of alcohol means that the liver can regenerate. So it may affect it for a little bit of time, say a day. That's probably why we feel hungover when we drink too much. That's part of it. But then it will regenerate and it will sort itself out. Great, thank you. Um, and then what... Um, let's have a look here. Can you please go over carcinogens again? Yes, no problem. Sorry, it has been... There's quite a lot to do today. So it might have been a bit quick. So carcinogens, go back to this slide, that'll allow you to make some notes as well if you need to. Carcinogens or carcinogen is a word that we use to describe something that causes cancer by causing mutations. So they may be chemicals in cigarette smoke, um, ultraviolet radiation from the sun is a carcinogen, some viruses can act as a carcinogen, um, making us more at risk of some cancers. Alcohol can be a carcinogen in large quantities um, and also a very fatty diet can have a carcinogenic effect. So carcinogen is, is kind of a descriptive word for a risk factor for cancer. I'll leave the rest of that slide up for now so you can have a look through it. Right, and then some people are asking if we can do more questions, which I think you were just about to do anyway. Yes, no, that's fine. I'll, um, I'll do some past paper questions and you can see kind of how this topic would be approached in an exam. Okay. Got one question here. Let's zoom in a little bit. The concentration of cholesterol in the blood affects people's health give two factors that affect the concentration of cholesterol in the blood. When we're doing questions, I always try and underline the keywords so that I answer them correctly. So we want two factors that affect the concentration of cholesterol in the blood. Okay, so we talked about cholesterol 
Cholesterol is the fatty substance that um, affects arteries, so it can build up in arteries. We also talked about things that affect the amount of cholesterol. So your diet, having a very fatty diet, means that more cholesterol will be produced. Um, genetic makeup means that uh, some people are more, basically are more efficient at creating cholesterol in their liver because of their genetic makeup. And also the amount of cholesterol production by the liver, which may be a result of genetic makeup, um, also affects the amount in the blood. But you'd only need to give two of those because it's a two mark question. Okay, here we've got a graph. So doctors screened men for blood cholesterol concentration. The doctors then compared death rates from heart disease with deaths from all causes in this screened group. This is quite complicated, so definitely worth underlining. So they compared death rates from heart disease with deaths from all causes. Graphs show the results. So deaths per year per thousand males. So we've got deaths on our y-axis. Blood cholesterol concentration on our x-axis, and we've got two lines. Dotted line is heart disease. So if we look at that dotted line, it starts low, low number of deaths per year, and then as blood cholesterol increases, the deaths go up due to heart disease. And deaths from all causes, um, so they start by decreasing. And then as blood cholesterol uh, increases, it kind of plateaus and then it starts to go up at the end with a sharp upward spike at the end there. What's the best conclusion that can be drawn from the data? So here they're asking you to think about um, the, what we talked about with correlation and causation. Got three options. So there's a positive correlation between blood cholesterol concentration and deaths from all causes. Okay, there sort of is, but it went down a bit at the start. There is a negative correlation between blood cholesterol concentration and deaths from all causes. Well, a negative correlation would mean that deaths went down as blood cholesterol went up, so that's definitely not true. And finally, blood cholesterol concentration is only one of several factors affecting death from all causes. Both the first and the third could be said to be true from this graph, but they've asked for the best conclusion. And because of this downward spike at the beginning, we can't really say that there's a direct positive correlation between um, blood cholesterol concentration and deaths from all causes. All causes is the solid line, remember. So the best answer here is that blood cholesterol is one of several factors affecting death from all causes. So there may be other factors that are causing that pattern. Okay, finally, a healthy diet contains the right balance of different foods and the right amount of energy. An unbalanced diet can lead to health problems. One problem caused by an unbalanced diet is being overweight. Name one health problem other than being overweight that's linked to an unbalanced diet. So you need one health problem for one mark and you can't say being overweight. We talked about two today. We talked about diabetes or heart disease, both of which coronary heart disease. Both of those can be um, made more likely by being overweight. Okay. Sugar is a type of carbohydrate. We learned that in one of our first sessions a couple of weeks ago about digestion. 
Eating too much sugar can make a person overweight. Suggest why. So if you're overweight, it means you're taking in more energy than you can use. And so your body then stores that extra energy as fat. Which other substance in food is linked to people being overweight? Other substance. So not sugar. Draw a ring around the correct answer. Fat, mineral ions or vitamins? The answer is fat. Okay, so that's some of the questions that you might come across. A lot of the questions that you'll get for this kind of topic will be on interpreting graphs and interpreting data. Something that um, can be quite difficult to teach in this format, but it's something that you can get good at by doing lots of practice questions. Um, so it's well worth looking at that and thinking about that um, when you're doing your practice questions and making sure that you become very familiar with reading a question properly, looking at a graph properly. So you'll notice that when we looked at this graph, the first thing I did was to look at the axes. Um, so I looked at the Y axes and I looked at the X axes, made sure I knew what units they were in, what was being shown. And then I had a look at the key for the graph, which there is for this one. There's not always a key but for this particular line graph there is made sure I knew which was which, so I didn't get them mixed up in any of the later questions. And then I had a look at any kind of general trends in the graph, even before I'd looked at the question. So make sure you're really familiar with a figure before you even look at the question. Okay. Do we have any more questions on the chat? Just having a quick look now. Um, I don't think we do, but we do have sort of five, ten minutes. So if we have any more questions for you to go through them, that would be great. If anyone else has any more questions they want to ask, please do let us know. I'll have a quick look. I can see some on. questions on here but I think have we been through most of them yes we've just had a new one come in asking if it uses artificial valves won't the body's defense system react badly to a foreign material oh that's a really good question yes we didn't talk about that and that actually links into one of the risks with heart transplants as well so yes you're right as soon as you put something foreign into the body our bodies quite often go oh hold on this isn't right let's get it out um, but of course, for a heart transplant or an artificial valve, we want it to stay in. So quite often when you first put in something like a heart transplant or an artificial valve, you have to take immune suppressant drugs to stop your immune system trying to attack it um, and take out your artificial valve or your artificial heart. Um, so yes, you do normally have to take drugs that stop your immune system doing that. And of course, that means that your immune system is then more um, susceptible to other diseases. So you have to be very careful when you're recovering that you don't get anything like pneumonia. It's quite easy to pass on. Okay. Any more? Oh, there was one here about vaccination, actually, that I've just noticed. Didn't have, ah, so vaccination. Um, so if you haven't had chicken pox, don't have to worry. Um, you may well have had a vaccination. And vaccination is something that we're going to cover kind of a bit more next time. But a vaccination means that you've had a small amount of the disease injected into your body, only a tiny, tiny amount, not enough to cause a full-blown attack, but it does mean that your immune system um, gets used to that disease. So it, it recognises it, 
recognises it, understands that it would need to get rid of it if it happened again. And therefore you get a much quicker response if you do get exposed to the disease after you've been vaccinated. But we'll talk about that kind of a bit more um, in a couple of sessions time, I think, vaccination. Great. Um, someone's asked if you could please go back to the effect on babies slide. Oh, yes. Um, and while we're doing that, someone else has asked, um, if you drink a lot of water, does that clear up your arteries? Um, in short, no, it can help because water is a big part of blood. We need to drink water, lots of water each day um, to help ourselves, to help keep our blood at the right concentration and water is used for all sorts of things within the body as well. It doesn't necessarily help clear arteries though because water, I don't know if you've ever poured water and oil together, so water and fat, well fat kind of repels water so water doesn't break it down so if, you, if you've got a really greasy dish when you've been cooking a roast and you put it in the sink and you put it in just water, the grease doesn't really come off very well and you have to put some sort of dishwashing um, tablet or liquid or something into the water to help it break down those fatty materials. So just water isn't enough to break down the fats, it usually has to have other things in it. But over time, so cholesterol building up in the arteries isn't necessarily a permanent thing. Um, it can be lowered over time. So part of it would always be able to be carried away by the blood, but only a small part, so not the whole thing. So, but obviously if, if you continue to eat a very fatty diet or continue to do the things that led to having heart disease, then um, it will have difficulty in breaking itself down quickly enough to reset as such. Okay. Any more? I can see a couple coming in, I think, or some sort of comment. I think that's everything. Um, and I think if we just do, we have time to answer one more um, question and then that will be everything. Okay. No problem. Have a look through. I should have something. Okay, let's do this one. This one's much more kind of tailored for interpreting graphs, which was what we were talking about not that long ago. So here's the question, have a read of this while I'm pulling up the graph, or part of the question. Explanation. And I'll pull up the graph and we can have a look at that. Okay, so let's do what we did before. Let's underline these and then we'll look at um, some, a couple of questions. So doctors trialed four different treatments for reducing the risk of heart disease. Each treatment was trialed on the same number of patients for five years. The patients did not have heart disease at the start of the trial. Graph shows the results. So the first thing we do is have a look at the axes. We've got number of patients who need treatment for heart disease during the trial. It goes from zero to 450. And then our x-axis is treatment. So we have aspirin, beta blockers, diuretics and statins. 
Okay. We've heard of statins. We talked about them today. They decrease the amount of cholesterol that's produced in the liver. The others are other drugs that can be used. Okay, let's pull up some questions. I pull these up and then you can have a look at them. Let's move them alongside. How many patients who took aspirin needed treatment for heart disease during the trial? Have a think. Okay. You had a look, have a look at the graph, um, check the units. So it's 420. Okay. Based only on the evidence in the graph, which would be the best treatment to reduce the risk of developing heart disease? Number of pa patients who needed treatment for heart disease during the trial. Well, statins is the one that needed the least treatment. So let's put the letter S here. And then suggest one other factor that a doctor might consider before deciding which treatment to use for a patient. Have a think. I can think of a few here. So we could say other medical conditions. Uh, we could say any side effects of the treatment. Then having a look at the mark scheme. Any other medication that's being taken. Straighten that out a little bit. Okay, so that's another sort of question that you could have about interpreting graphs. Okay, how are we doing for time? I think that's all we have time for at the moment. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining and for staying tuned. Um, and um, this session has been recorded as I said at the beginning. Um, so looking forward to seeing you guys at the next session um, and make sure you've signed up to the MyTutor Online School so you can get a timetable of what's to come. Thank you, Charlotte, and thank you everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>